Time to fire up the VCR. This one's my favorite. Welcome to Analog Jones in the Temple of Film. I'm Steve. I'm uh, Matt. And we have uh, our special guest, Alex, coming back with us today. How are you doing, Alex? Good. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks for being uh, our Adam Scott for our Death <laughs> Wish movies. Uh, just coming back every time we take a look at one of these fucking things. <laughs> so, guys, how was the Windy City Horrorama brunch? It was great. It was successful. It was fun. And people came. <laughs> I think when it comes down to it, that's all that matters. Yeah, what we set out to do, we did. We had a good time doing it. And I think people are really excited about the fest. And thanks to those who did come out. We had a really good time. The brunch at Fat Cat is pretty amazing, by the way. I had some pretty bomb chicken and waffles. And, uh, and do keep an eye out because if you couldn't make it to yesterday's event, we will have more coming up, including... A, a launch event on the 23rd, on March 23rd at Bucket of Blood Books in Records, where we will be revealing the program of the festival. Uh, we'll have more giveaways, more fun stuff. Uh, we're going to open up the, the little market of goodies that uh, that we opened up at Fat Cat. And there may be even more, because it sounds like more places around town want to participate. So we're really excited. Hope to see you there. I was really impressed when I came in to the brunch at the end, and that many people had waited around. I was mm. like, yes, because I had a bad start to the morning, but I got there. <laughs> yeah, no, people were there. People came, people stayed throughout the whole day, which was really, really fun. We had a few survivors left at the very end, the bitter end, too, which is really nice. Like Alex said, we're going to be doing more of this stuff, and then just keep an eye out on all our social media. It's Windy City Horrorama, uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Keep an eye on it. There's going to be more. We're going to do more of this shit. It's working. So we're going to keep keep doing stuff, and then April 27th through the 29th, we're at the Davis Theater. Come see us. All right, let's get in to Death Wish 2018. Every year, there are 3.7 million home invasions. What if your family... Was next. Daniel, I failed to protect my family. So there's nothing that I can do. You can have faith. Help faith work out for them. You're not a cop, but somebody has to do it. If a man wants to protect what's his, he has to do it for himself. You killed my wife. Who else was there? Death Wish, rated R. Directed <laughs> by the man Eli Roth, the hostile man himself. I love Eli Roth. I I know it's not cool, I guess, to like, to like Eli Roth, but like I do. I like him. I like his movies. I like them all. I like the gore. I like the the schlockiness. I like the absurdity. I like the sort of fuck you nature of his movies. So this actually seemed like a good fit for him. But we'll get into that. <laughs> <laughs> I conversely am the coolest guy in the world apparently <laughs> because I don't like Eli Roth or I typically don't. I actually I'm morbidly curious about him usually as a filmmaker um, so I'm always interested to see uh, what he brings to a movie because uh, regardless of whether or not I like it he does typically have a, a voice in what he makes and uh, that is important and he is uh, a successful and well-known horror filmmaker which is also important in American film so Let's get to it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's always hit and miss to me. Sometimes I think, even throughout his movies, they're hit and miss. Like, scene to scene, you're like, well, that one worked, mm, that one didn't. Yeah. <laughs> but I always feel like he's going to one day, like, really hit, like, putting it all together. I know people could say, like, well, he had Hostel, and that was massive. Yes, but I think there will be one that's non-whore that he's... I think this is him trying to branch out into some exploitation action. He's trying to say something here. I just don't know if it's clear at all. <laughs> yeah, he's probably a few movies away from finding his like groove for that. I think I think we are going to see though. He is going to make something that's controversial that makes people mad, but it's good. Generally well regarded as good. I think that's going to happen. I do think we're still a few movies away cuz this wasn't quite it. So, this was produced by Roger Brinbaum. I think that's how you say his name, the man who did Rush Hour 1 and 2. That's like his huge hits. I was also looking at his filmography. He's done a lot of remakes lately. 
We have Death Wish right here, the Magnificent Seven, mm -hmm. and I spelled it Salvin, <laughs> Savin, uh, mm -hmm. Robocop, and Footloose, all in a seven year span. Man. He's, he's yeah. doing MGM remakes. Yeah. That's what it is. They're remakes of MGM films. Yeah. All, almost all of them, I think. Yeah, wow. Uh, that's a. I mean, I guess it's a job, huh? <laughs> it's a living. He must, well, he, that, he must he must be, I don't know, on salary at MGM or something and, and in charge of getting the remakes made. But, yeah, uh, they're like, call up Roger. We're doing another remake. <laughs> <laughs> we also had this written by many, many different people. Uh, Depending on who you ask, yeah. this is who this was written by. <laughs> right. So Joe Carnahan kind of did the original screenplay. I think he did, and they probably just kept like the actual bare bones of it, maybe, because this moved on to, I don't know, in 2003, I guess they had creative differences, so it just sat there for a while, and then Eli Roth comes in, he's like, oh, I got a great idea, guys! <laughs> I mean, Joe Carnahan has, as, as I understand it, disowned this. He he basically said, his, has public, he's gone on record as saying, I didn't write that. Like, whatever, what you're watching, like, that's not me. Like, that was not the movie that I intended to make. I wonder if, because he came out with such a fuck you and I can't believe you made this movie attitude, is if, like, if their revenge was keeping his name on the movie. <laughs> yeah, well... Like, the studio was just like, all right, you're going to be an asshole? You're the writer. Deal with it. <laughs> well, I, it probably has more something to do with, with uh, the weird union rules, uh, Writer's Guild. Stuff gets weird like that. But Carnahan was... Also, at the time when he wrote it, was was supposed to direct it, mm -hmm. um, and I'm interested. I'm more interested in seeing that movie. <laughs> to be completely honest, I'm I'm fifty fifty on Carnahan. Uh, I like some of his stuff, and some of his stuff is just like a little bit like too much, like American Guy Ritchie or something like that. Like mm -hmm. some of it, you know, he, he sometimes he tries too hard to be cool. I almost I hesitate to say, but I I almost feel like we kind of would have still got the same result if he made it. I just <laughs> I just think making a Death Wish movie in 2018 is just the worst fucking idea ever. <laughs> yep. Oh, I and I am in complete complete agreement. <laughs> if you're a person of a certain mentality in this in I I, I I'm tr trying to choose my words wisely here. You'll wait for you to be done so I can just say. It. <laughs> yeah. Basically like this is this is like an alt right wet dream this movie. <laughs> I don't know. Like that's what it felt like to me. It, the movie opens with sorry to, for me to just like dive into this, but the yeah, movie no, it's the time. movie literally opens with a skyline view of Chicago of all places followed with like audio clippings of people talking about what a war zone Chicago is as and I can just imagine like Donald Trump like masturbating as he like <laughs> is like watching and listening to that like first shot of that movie I was half expecting to hear his voice in the fracas because he's gone on record all the time being like Chicago it's a war zone it's the worst we got to do something about it which is basically the opening message of that movie and apparently the what we need to do about it is just all pick up guns and start shooting people. Which reminds me, <laughs> when you guys were over here last week, one of you left your bulletproof vest. I don't want you to walk outside without it. <laughs> oh, it's so rough here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fear for my life every day. Like you said, I I was surprised to yeah not hear Donald Trump at the beginning of the movie, but we did get the uh, the replacement with fucking man cow man cow in there <laughs> instead, which is just the pride enough. of Chicago, just enough for us. Yeah, way to yeah. way to show us how we're doing here. I, we gotta say that like the theater we went to was pretty full. Now a lot of these people were white trash, but <laughs> it was full. <laughs> Whoa, whoa. Hey. <laughs> that guy in front of us was white trash. <laughs> was in a black hoodie, had long hair, 350 pounds. Oh, okay, you're right. You're right. <laughs> How, did, was it just me? Or did the theater smell, smell terrible? Like a mildewy wet hoodie. Like, like an unwashed black hoodie that, that somebody's been wearing since the beginning of time. Like, yep, <laughs> yep. Uh, it, I mean, I'll try to continue help setting the scene there. We were in a, like, at least two-thirds full theater. Mm. Yeah, it, it smelled like some, like, laundry that had been left outside for a while. <laughs> 
the one of the bass speakers was like uh, one of the bases on one of the speakers was definitely shot and i'm pretty sure the the color tinting was a little off on the projector which was like the perfect way to watch this movie <laughs> like the scene was set it was perfect couldn't have imagined a more appropriate scenario <laughs> yeah I couldn't concentrate on all that because I was having so much fun watching one of the greatest films of all time. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's go into the cast here a little bit. We had Bruce Willis sleepwalking his way as Dr. Paul Kersey. <laughs> and holy shit, come on, dude, give us something. This, you used to be the most charismatic action star around. Die Hard is still one of the franchises you go back to and you're like, that's how you do it. That's mm -hmm. how you mix action and someone worth watching. And he, it's, it's gone. Uh, yeah, he just. I really thought that this was going to be one, because he hasn't top-lined a movie since uh, Red 2. I looked it up. That's the last time he's, like, top-lined a movie. So this was five years ago now. Uh, uh, a major movie. Yeah. Right. A theatrically released major movie he mm -hmm. hasn't top-lined since Red 2, which was woof. And, uh, I'll take your word. And that was five years ago. Um, so you'd think he'd be a little more alive here. I, I feel like he's almost worse than usual here. He is... He literally, like, is supposed to be, like, a doctor running through the halls, and he is just <laughs> shuffling. Well, and it is literally, like, a representation of his performance throughout the movie. There's a moment where he learns that his wife and daughter, after the, the whatever, the home invasion scene, which we could talk about in a little bit, he... They, they are brought to the hospital that he works at. By the way, Paul Kersey uh, now is a surgeon as opposed to an architect. Another, another paragon of, of sort of upper middle class liberalism mm. here. And he learns that they are in the ICU. He is about to discover that his wife has died on the operating table. I cannot Im I, I could not believe how slowly he was moving <laughs> to get there. He was supposed to be like, my wife is dying. Maybe, like, not breaking, like, two and a half miles an hour going down that hallway. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Just sleepwalking. Now, somebody who was underutilized and, and just fantastic as usual was Vincent D'Onofrio. Emmy Award winning. Yeah. Vincent mm -hmm. D'Onofrio. Always have to mention. That's yeah. that's how, actually, you have to introduce yourself at a party to him. <laughs> <laughs> this like, is Emmy Award winner yes. uh, Vincent D'Onofrio. Yeah. So, he's so, great as usual. In this movie. Now, could you guys imagine how fun this movie would have been if he was the lead? Oh my god, that's how, an like, amazing how, idea. Like, yeah. yeah, like seeing, like, he would be so alive during those, like, death scenes and things like that. Like, All right, let's he'd go. be chewing scenery and it'd be great. What if they became a tag team duo and Bruce was the serious one and Vincent was the one worth watching? I'd watch why, that movie. Why wasn't that done? Because that would have separated it enough from the originals. Like, yeah. really what you only changed in this was he's a doctor, and that's it. Like, if you're going to do a remake, take the bare bones of the script and make your own thing. And to me, that is what this movie suffers from, um, among other things. But that's what irritated me the most. I cannot stand remakes who can't stand on their That cannot stand on their own. Right. And... Well, and the other thing that it kind of tries to do, and I think lazily, and I think like this is where I start to think like Eli Roth was the wrong person to try to make this work, as much of a long shot as it was, was that they try to pay lip service to like what the what the situation of violent crime is in a city like Chicago, which the movie just like can't do. Uh, it it has like no understanding, and it tries to pay lip service to the fact that most of that violence is happening in impoverished areas. It's, it's such a tricky situation. They wrap it around this scenario where that world invades this guy who lives in Evanston <laughs> in, a, in a McMansion, which I'm pretty sure we can all attest to pretty much never happens. Yeah. Which is part of the problem of the situation in Chicago, that it is so segregated, that those worlds can be so far apart, and that the one moment when that encroaches on that affluent white world is when the guy goes nuts and grabs the gun and starts killing more people. Like, I don't know what that's trying to... I don't think Eli Roth knows what's, what that's I don't think trying it was, to say. I don't think it was trying to say anything. I think that's the problem. The first movie is so much like... Paul Kersey has had enough with crime and goes and kills every black person he sees. In this one, it's basically... 
Paul Kersey needs to come and save the black people. He needs right. to go to those impoverished neighborhoods mm-hmm. and shoot up the bad guys to protect the the good black people from the bad black people. Very misguided, but also just like so not of that world. Like they're just so confused. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I cannot disagree with that. Just, when sway sway yeah and he had his co-host on there when she's just like he's saving the good people and obviously they pick a black mm-hmm. female where right. it's to just say that line. to say that line it's it's completely on purpose there was a lot of things they put in this just so they're like listen we're not just killing brown people like they did in canon we're <laughs> killing all the peoples that are right. bad no matter what their color and i i give them at least that credit but it, it's still <laughs> it, but I don't know it wasn't working it it had a stench to me of just like paying lip service to being like but we don't really mean it or but but we understand that there's like a wrinkle to it but they never like truly explore it and they also most disappointingly don't explore it in a way that I think a lot of great exploitation films can Mm. do by kind of getting into the shit and getting their hands dirty in a in in a way that is a little bit more shocking and controversial this one was honestly uh, for especially for an Eli Roth film kind of anonymous yeah it wasn't it wasn't controversial it wasn't it didn't go far enough it didn't push enough buttons it was so tepid it was so reserved in wanting to go there like it was either just full-on revenge bloody who gives a fuck let's pick up a gun and shoot some bad guys it didn't go that way i feel like the questions it tried to answer ask were questions that were left over from carnahan's script probably where it was they were trying to make a movie about you know what is the nature of violence like you know things like that that they just sort of bare bones picked apart instead of letting the audience ask those questions they had the fucking radio DJs come in and literally ask the questions to the audience instead of letting the audience form their own questions. I think this is kind of like a, a half-assed version of Death Sentence, which I think James Wan's Death Sentence, which is based on the same author's book that Tempo, wrote Death Wish. <laughs> Let's uh, finish off the cast here. So we had Elizabeth Shue as Lucy Rose Kersey, Paul's wife. You knew she was fucked right away because she's related to Paul Kersey, and mm-hmm. if you are related to Paul Kersey, just leave him (laughs) (laughs) that's right she did nothing really and in the very little time she had to do nothing she was still a better actor than bruce oh elizabeth she's great yeah she she's an amazing actress i'm always happy to see her on screen i'm just sad that like she just had nothing she just had to show up and die for this is this what we get now with elizabeth shu is she just going to play these roles yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's how Hollywood treats uh, talented middle-aged actresses. She needs to go. Uh, some some uh, independent producers or directors need to go like give her the role that she deserves. That's always what that's that's how it always has to work because you know. Okay, you got your moment. You got your. Did she win an Oscar? Was she just nominated for? I think she leaving was nominated. Oscar? But you know, she she had her time there, and they're like, oh, you go too old. Yeah, um, which is, it's, it's, she's an incredibly talented actress. I was so excited to see her in something. And, uh, yeah, she's just there to get sacrificed to the, to the, to the pyre of, of vigilante justice, <laughs> which is a shame. Did yeah. you notice they were putting her in uh, Midwest uh, mother clothing? I say, they're like, we're, they were trying to ground her. Uh, you had her in flannels, mm-hmm. the giant scarves. She looked like someone who is from Chicago and the Midwest and in their mid-40s. I give them that. It appears someone has actually lived here. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, So good for them. I also picked up a few of the lines that, like, Chicago people will love. You get with the, like, oh, shut up, Lake. That one guy at the soccer game at the beginning. Yeah, Kelsum Lakeshore. Kelsum Lakeshore. And I was like, that's... Okay, someone clearly had something to do with the, the writing part of this where they brought in someone from Chicago to add these... Thank you for that, being, you know, <laughs> living in Chicago. That was fun to hear. But, yeah, the, I don't have a lot of pros for this other than get those guns, kill those sons of bitches. They're all bad. <laughs> well, um, as another part of the cast here, we had Chicago's finest mad cow. Oh, man cow. That was one other thing that, that they got right about Chicago culture to where if there was just, like, a middle-aged, bald, white dude who started, like, shooting up diverse neighborhoods, like, that's exactly how Man Cow would react. He would be like, yeah, I love it. It's great. Uh, tell me about it. Call me up. But uh, but I, I, I think this is exactly what Chicago needs. I feel like I've heard him say yeah. things exactly like that. 
where I just want to throw my car radio out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, do you want to tell us the story about you sitting behind Mad Cow? Yeah, so I went to see Adam Green's Frozen in theaters because I like Adam Green, and it was obviously not packed. You know, it was a Anchor Bay release of a horror movie in 2012 or whatever it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody was there, but it's you know five people, and of course I'm sitting there, and fucking Mad Cow and some, one of his buddies walks in, sits right in front of me talks the whole movie Ugh. and laughs throughout the whole movie and I'm just like dude why are you fucking here like why did you come just to bitch and moan and like talk and like be front, be funny to your like sidekick that's gonna laugh at everything you say cause you're a man cow like that's my question whenever I remember man cow exists is why are you here <laughs> what is your purpose why do you exist you still exist a blight on Chicago culture <laughs> you know I just had a theory guys I think People drive badly in Chicago because they're listening to Man Cow. <laughs> because they just get like riled up and aggressive because they're he's just feeding that impulse and then they just like take it out on the road as they're driving and they're listening to him and they're like, Yeah, I'm gonna fucking cut this guy off because I'm supposed to own the world and I'm forty five and white. <laughs> you know, like that's what I believe. I'm I'm gonna take that actually and swerve into the movie here. Yeah. Like, so I'm impulsive, <laughs> and uh, I tend to like revenge movies because of the darkness inside me and things like that I need to deal with on my own. Um, but uh, I tend to, yeah, I tend to be very satisfied with revenge movies and impulsive behavior and things like that. But swerving back into this movie, this is really unsatisfying. Just overall, like nothing. Nothing really stands out. Nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, none of the like the death scenes were like, yeah, we got him. Like it didn't feel like like a like a punch like it should. E- like even in the uh, some of the original Death Wish movies, when they get the bad guys, it's pretty satisfying. Like yeah. this isn't. This really wasn't that satisfying. Yeah. It was just sluggish and yeah. generic and characterless. That's that's kind of just how it felt to me. You nailed it. When Matt and I were coming home in the car ride, I said. This is a cookie cutter script. It's like, this is who they are. This is what happens. This is what he has to do. And he's learned his lesson. America likes that. It's fine. And I I like to see movies like this, even if I don't necessarily agree with it politically, because uh, I want the edge. This movie has no edge, though. You know what else middle America likes? Bruce Willis. (laughs) I'm serious. My... I can't remember. I, I think I was in college and my dad called me up and we were just talking about stuff. And he talked about the movie he went to see. Do you guys remember that? I can't remember the title. The the movie with Bruce Willis about the robot clones or whatever. Sur- surrogates. 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 He, was talking, he was talking <laughs> to me about how he saw it, surrogates. And I was like, okay, what would you think of that? And he was like, it was all right. <laughs> but he saw it. They got his money yeah. because that's how that works. Because they'll go see a movie with Bruce Willis in it. Mm-hmm. It's he's, the Bruce Willis movie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's known, he's recognizable, and for some reason, a lot of America, and maybe even other countries, love that stone-cold look of no emotion. This was something I was thinking about as I was watching it, especially in the first half of the movie, when they start to basic, when the movie basically starts to build Paul's case for what he's about to do, where I'm like, this is kind of dangerous, especially after all the school shootings and everything like that. There, but there are there are a lot of people out there that will respond positively to that. They're like, this is the valid, like where 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 they're where they're getting this idea from all sides where we need to put some guns away, guys. Like maybe more guns aren't the answer to these to these to the problem of guns killing people. And then this movie just kind of drops that goes. But let's think about maybe guns do help. More guns do help. <laughs> Who knows, guys? And the movie is made just competently enough and makes the case just competently enough where if it goes unchallenged, you could see people going, yeah, yeah, this is exact. This is what I'm talking about, guys, you know, <laughs> after being bombarded with, let's put the guns away because children shouldn't die anymore, you know, for them to go, for, for this movie to show up and be like, no, 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 this is how we deal with violent problems. <laughs> it's just competent enough to be a- adopted by that kind of worldview very easily. Yeah, it's always that kind of like right in that middle line mm-hmm. of how do we not make 
it look beautiful to be a vigilante, but at the same time, if something happens to your family, you need to defend it. So it's always like that, because none of us have ever had our children, you know, like almost killed or our wives uh, that I know of. You guys should probably <laughs> tell me now. Um, so it's, it's always writing that line and there's no easy answer. You know, you can't just tell someone, oh, you can't defend yourself. You know, because right. that, that's not how it works. Because right. they're going to tell you to fuck you, and then you've lost your argument. Mm-hmm. There's no real easy answer on this. I, what I wish is this movie wouldn't have done that. I wish it would have been no holds bar. Like, mm. I'm going to kill you and everyone you know in this because it's a revenge movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it doesn't. It's not cutthroat enough. Right. Yeah. That's, I the, that's the problem. wanted it to be ugly. I think the right way to do that movie and to be like the having your cake and eating it too, which I think you guys are kind of getting into, is that you just, you let that violence be like as juicy and like nuts and crazy as possible. So it can be cathartic to an audience as they're watching it, but then it can, but the ugliness can also sort of speak for itself to be like, this is ridiculous. This is a fantasy. I always think of Punisher Warzone when I yeah. think of that. Like, that. like that's the movie that like does that. Even <laughs> even the Thomas Jane Punisher does that a little uh-huh. bit and, and it works. And yeah, and I go back to Death Sentence. Death Sentence is a perfect representation of that where it's like, you kind of do get your rocks off a little bit, but then mm-hmm. you like, you pay for it too. Yeah. And that's like the way they should have handled this movie. And, yeah. they, and they had Kevin Bacon willing to like get dirty and be crazy too yeah, yeah. in that movie which is always awesome paul kersey here has no the only thing he lost is his wife right nothing will come of this that's the one thing you know like maybe if he would have got his hand blown off and he could no longer be a surge and you're like you got your revenge hey but... wow they should hire you to write movies <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea you should yeah, go that, pitch that he should have had his hand than... blown off when he yeah when he had that clip go back yeah. that's what it should have happened i thought they were going to do something like that because they kept mentioning he's left-handed he cut his hand i go okay so he's the so that means he can't do surgery yeah. anymore so it would eliminate like but this it didn't want to go that far right. it didn't want to punish the vigilante and i think when you were alex mentioning that like this is a little dangerous I think that's why people thought this was a pro alt right movie, but I don't. It's not. It, it's, it's not. It's, it's nothing. nothing. It's nothing. That's <laughs> the problem with it. Like, if it was a super, if it like was just offensive, I probably still would have enjoyed it because like it would have at least just been something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. It's I don't know. Everything is done in half measures. With when something is pitched in that way, it gives the impression of being reasonable sometimes. Uh, reasonable to certain types of people, which in turn then can almost make it more dangerous <laughs> or right. more or or more easily uh, used as 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 certain ammunition. I will say though, the one thing I noticed that had in common between the Death Wish movie that we watched last week and this one is the somnambulant star cashing a huge paycheck and then not giving anything on screen. He, in a way. He's kind of, uh, uh, Bruce Willis is kind of honoring Charles Bronson's legacy. I was about to say that same exact thing. Talk about perfect casting for a remake. Like, if you want to get an actor late in their career, just sleepwalking through things, I mean, there's no better parallel than Bronson to Willis. Like, it is fucking perfect. They are at the same points in their careers doing a Death Wish movie. Literally perfect casting. All right, I'll finish off the notes I have here. Dean Norris as Detective Brains. This guy is always a cop, and may I say, well done. He's actually very good at adding just little tidbits of his character in there and how he takes lines and bounces them right back, especially Bruce Willis. Like, when he, they, at the very end of the movie, he's just like, is the Glock gun for good? Bruce, bounce it back right off him. And he's just like, yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> like, come on, man! <laughs> Dean Norris is a good character actor as well, yeah. but he tends to play the same character. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my only... I mean, I, I hesitate to call it a complaint, especially in this movie where you're kind of sifting for good things. Yeah. <laughs> where I'm like, oh, at least he's a little lively. The I found the gluten thing a little gl- groan-worthy. There's like a yeah. running joke where he's supposed to be gluten-free, and it's like, no. That's, it's, that's uh, playing my, into that mm, fucking eat, alt-right eat fantasy my, world. Eat my gross glute, gluten-free bar and it's like come on man i've eaten bars like that they taste good yeah it's like it's fine you're fine you're not a fucking child like (laughs) you may not like it but just eat it like don't be an asshole well that's just fitting into their crowd that's gonna watch it exactly no that's what that is but at the same time 
it is still you've got things that you know liberal eyes can point to and be like oh no they're trying to say that and then conservative eyes obviously there's stuff they can point to this movie is just trying to play both sides and just not doing very well either way i will say before we finish this off the things that i think work in this movie like a positive are the eli rothisms for sure the home invasion scene is pretty tense and it mm-hmm. works. It's mm-hmm. a it's a good scene. It doesn't veer too far off the rails, but it's it's tense enough. I liked that. I liked the home invasion scene. Some of the revenge, not all of it, unfortunately, but some of the revenge has some fucking pretty gnarly effects in it, and that's the stuff I came for, like smashed heads and broken necks and things like that. That's what I that's what I showed up in theaters for, and we get a little bit of it, and I liked what we got, but I wish we got more. Yeah, not <laughs> enough. And I yeah, I never. As, as somebody who's not a fan of Eli Roth, I never thought I would say this, but this movie needed more Eli Roth. I agree. <laughs> as a fan, yeah, this needed way more Eli Roth. Like, it's, the touches we had were really nice, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Did you notice we had a Mike Epps appearance? Black yeah. Doug? Yeah, Mike but, Epps shows up for a second just to be like, it's okay, he likes black people. Like, <laughs> he, I think he had, like, three lines in the yeah. movie. Yeah. Mike Epps? That guy's not cheap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like they, they probably had to pay a lot of money for him to show up for hmm, about maybe 45 seconds of screen time. <laughs> yeah, as soon as he got on there and I saw who it was and what character he's playing, I go, oh, come on. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, really? He, it's it's he, just to be like, I've got a black friend. Yeah, that's what that is. That that's he is all the that character is. to be like, oh, it's okay. I have a black friend. <laughs> but again, even that was a half measure. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. he just disappears. Right. He's only there when it's convenient in the first act. And then I'm wondering if he got written out of the movie. Because again, like, Mike Epps is too big of a name to just show up that. I wonder if they tried to do something with that that they ended up just, like, getting rid of. I guarantee mm-hmm. you there are scenes in there that they had to cut out for runtime. Mm-hmm. Because no one wants to go watch a two-hour Death Wish movie. We want it 90 nine minutes right to go behind the scenes just a little bit and then we'll move on to our nerd news this thing had development hell this remake got started in 2006 with sylvester stallone announcing that he would direct and star in it Ooh, that yeah. would have been awful yeah that's probably worse than what we got so we yeah. got stallone told ain't it cool news instead of charles bronson's character being an architect my version would have had him as a very good cop who had incredible success without using his gun. So when the attack of his family happens, he's really thrown into a moral dilemma and proceeding to carry out his revenge. I cannot find out why this never got off the ground or anything like that. Because it sounds like Copland. <laughs> it's Copland. <laughs> the movie is Copland, which he already started. <laughs> what were you going to say? <laughs> oh, I was just going to say that just... That just didn't sound particularly interesting to me either (laughs) because yeah like it seems like i don't know he's done that yeah before why Uh, are we trying to put reason to these death wish movies (laughs) (laughs) this isn't a reasonable movie (laughs) i don't watch 300 because i'm like oh i love this story here no i do it because i want to get pumped up to like work out why are (laughs) you doing this why are we putting reason to these films this isn't art This is fun. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe we would have gotten some more... I don't know. I'm thinking of when Stallone made that last Rambo movie. At least like that. That was was a fucking blast. Yeah, Yeah, that's what we needed in a Death Wish movie. That's what we needed. Yeah. That is trash, and it is so tasty. Oh, oh. that's my favorite kind of trash. Yeah. Yeah, It's like finding two trashes, like a half-eaten pizza and a half-eaten burger, (laughs) and shoving it in your mouth. (laughs) Yeah, it's, I don't know, it would have been, like, tasteless and irresponsible and, like, and just, like, absolutely unforgettable at the very least. Yes, yes. (laughs) In late January 2012, The Hollywood Reporter confirmed that a remake would be written and directed by Joe Carnahan. The film was originally set to star Liam Nielsen. Oh, surprise, surprise, he's putting Liam Nielsen in a movie. Oh, uh, that would have been... I, I think it would have been great, actually. Literally anybody but Bruce Willis, I'm, yeah. like, excited. Liam I'm like, Nielsen would be yeah. awesome. That but again, been, he's been making that movie already. Yeah. But, he, no, it's all, it all should have led to this, though. You know what I yeah. mean? Yeah. Like, the take-ins, the gray, all that should have led to finally Death Wish, and that should have been, like, his final, like 
Liam Neeson action movie, you know? That would have been so good. You just mentioned the one reason I would have been so interested in seeing the Joe Carnahan version of this movie, and it is The Grey, a movie that I think is absolutely incredible. But that was, I guess, a little bit more cerebral, but I would have loved them taking that idea of a man coping with his violent life and the and the horrible decisions he'd made, and then, like, and shoving it into, like, this, like, disgusting bee movie. Right, right. Like, that's... That's what it all should have mm, led to that. Man, I want it so grim. I want the, yeah, <laughs> yeah. the juice. We keep mentioning the juice. <laughs> <laughs> so when they replaced Carnahan, well, I don't know. I think he just, he walked out, and it was mm-hmm. all because of creative differences. Then they moved over to Geraldo uh, Naranjo. He was interested in casting Benicio Del Toro. Ooh, yes. Oh, oh my watch. God. You know I'm related to Benicio Del Toro? Fun are fact. Really? Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. All us Puerto Ricans are. It's <laughs> <laughs> not a blood relation. He is the godchild of like of one of my like great aunts or something like that. But we're but we're all like we're I don't know. It's all a web. Oh, and he, he is... and he would and he would crush a role like this. Just absolutely crush it. Yeah. Completely agree. You guys dropped the ball. But I I still <laughs> And then, so finally, after all this hell, I mean, this was years, too, right. if mm-hmm. you think about it. They finally got Eli Roth, who came in, and he's like, I kind of have a script for this, and this is how we should do it. And MGM was, like, on board immediately. So whatever he does to pitch a movie, congratulations, sir. He had to pitch this during when all this had really, it, it just kept escalating, all these school shootings. So whatever he said to them, I don't know if it was just like a bag of Coke. <laughs> <laughs> well, I he, he was on, the movie was made, and it was done, and it was supposed to come out in November, but obviously there was a shooting then, and now they don't even care. They're like, there was another shooting, but fuck it, let's put it out. It's never going to end. <laughs> like, we might as well just rip the Band-Aid off. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Matt, do you recommend Death Wish? Uh, No. I recommend the gore scenes because they're fun to watch, but that's about it. Alex, how about you? Again, hard pass. Wow, we all agree. Yeah, I say pass on this. This is a clip movie. This is watch it on YouTube where someone's reviewing it and they show you all the good parts and just pass. Go watch all the other Death Wishes. There's nothing in this where I'm like, oh, you have to see this scene. Because you can see it in the trailer. The like the <laughs> Grindhouse trailer they made I sent to Matt. They show the splatter of the head. I, I knew that was coming. I knew the broken neck was coming. This is a clip movie. Yeah, that's this all is you a, need. That's, that's it. all you need. I like how Eli Roth put together that like faux Grindhouse version of this thing. Which was almost like the movie that we all could have like wished that's like, the movie like we, we wanted. Could have, yeah. yeah, that's the movie we wanted to get, Eli. Like, you but, made the trailer. Why didn't you make the movie that way? Like, but what he did was he, like, cobbled together, like, the half dozen, like, crunchy gore shots in the movie and just, like, crammed them into the trailer. But just watch the Grindhouse trailer. You get all the good, juicy parts. Skip the movie. Maybe watch it when it comes out on HBO, Netflix, what have you, Amazon. But I'm certainly not going to rent this for $5. I'm certainly not going to buy it for $20. And even as a completist, I just let this go. Get death sentence. Yeah, yes, yeah, so honestly, skip the death sentence. Uh, that's your that's your death wish six, mm-hmm. basically. I don't even like death sentence that much, but I liked it a lot more than this. <laughs> <laughs> and now we're off to our nerd news. Get those nerds! Nerd! Nerd! All right. So the first bit of nerd news is box office. Uh, we're recording this on the Sunday of the weekend where Black Panther and Red Sparrow and Death Wish are all in theaters. So Black Panther once again takes the lead with 65.7 million. Wow. Still killing it, dropping only 41%, which is incredible for a superhero movie uh, from last week. It has accumulated an epic $501 million domestic. In the U.S.? 17 days in theaters. And And that's only the U.S.? Yes. My God. Yes. That movie's doing pretty good. <laughs> One would say. Just a wee bit. In second came Red Sparrow with $17 million. Probably what we would expect for that movie. Yeah, yeah. I got nothing to say about that one, so that's probably how everybody feels it, about so. it. I'll movie pass it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Death Wish, which we just talked about, opened with $13 million. It, there you go. This what it, it did what it did. This wow. this has it reported costing $30 million, mm. so I wonder if that's probably mm. just what they'll make. It's probably marketing and shit. Uh, was this marketed? I mean, 
mean, this we're gonna poorly. This. <laughs> I don't remember this being marketed though. Very yeah. poorly. I think again, like they were probably toning down the widespread marketing because of all of the negative news around school shootings. Yeah, um, t- and that that would sort of be them offering themselves up to the to the the culture and media uh, intelligentsia who would just tear them to shreds. So they probably did it right by by targeting marketing to our moms and dads. Yeah, <laughs> and, basically. Uh, and staying out of the big limelight and picking up the modest third place. Yeah, I think $13 million, it's on track to at least make its money back, but I just don't think it's going to like make make money. Well, th- those are usually like estimates, so I do wonder, and again, this is just like going to be cut, I do wonder if the Sunday box office number will be a little bit higher. Because that was a full the post, theater. The post-church crowd. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm serious, because when be... I walked in and I was looking for you in the second row, and I was like, what the fuck? Yeah, <laughs> that was my reaction. Maybe when we'll I came get in. to 15 million. I, or something. I think, yeah, I think this will be closer to 15, 16 mm. million. Okay, so Netflix is on fire for 2018. Their stock is at an all time high. Their company's worth is at an all time high. And I just saw an announcement saying they plan to have over 600 original titles come out this year. Now, what I couldn't check, does that count like individual episodes of shows? Or is that all just because 600 seems crazy. Like, how can one person (laughs) even come close to watching 200 of those in a year? Well, and I don't think they're expecting it. They're, they're basically doing the same thing that Cable did, only they're doing it all by themselves, where they're acquiring uh, niche things from all over the world and marketing uh, whatever they want you specifically to watch uh, mm-hmm. online. They're targeting me with, with stuff like Mute and Cloverfield uh, and The End of the Fucking World, the kind of things that, uh, that somebody in my demographic is, is going to watch. But then I'll go to work and I'll talk to somebody who's 20 years older than me and, they're gonna, and they tell me about some entirely different show on Netflix that I've never heard of, but they're telling me about how great it is. I do wonder if they're going to cousin off. They're going to create, like you were saying, demographics. Like you've got Netflix's, I don't know, spaceship, you know, like mm-hmm. come up with a name for these where you can more filter people into them. Because mm-hmm. I think right now Netflix is throwing paint at the wall to see what sticks mm-hmm. on purpose, try to suck in as many demographics as possible. But at a certain point, I don't want to swim through all that to get to what I want. And I right. feel that's what Netflix is slowly turning towards. It's taking me 30 minutes to find a freaking show to watch or mm-hmm. a movie. I don't want to deal with that. I'd rather go to Shudder. I know what I'm getting in that. Bam, watch it. Right. It takes me a couple minutes in Shudder. Right. No, I agree. Uh, I know that they started to sort of test that with their with their comedy uh, stuff where a lot of their stand-up specials uh, got funneled into... Uh, they, they they labeled it something different. I can't remember, but um, but I feel like they're they're on that track. They're going to eventually start segmenting off into channels. Yep. And it's than, cable all over again. Right. <laughs> you pay nine ninety nine a month for the regular Netflix, and the nine ninety nine for the sci fi Netflix, and for mm-hmm. the nine ninety nine for the comedy Netflix. Suddenly, you're paying a cable bill for all your different channels of but, content. But at least you would get the a la carte version, where I wouldn't have to buy. That's the one thing cable sucked about, $100 a month, and it was just like 90% of this I don't watch. At mm-hmm. least with an a la carte Netflix, you'd be like, okay, I want a sci-fi, I want a, I want a comedy. But what makes you think they're going to do that? <laughs> what mm. makes you think they're going to give you a la carte? <laughs> because, of the other, because of the other choices you have. All these other choices, I can just move on to Amazon and Hulu. I would drop Netflix like that if they pulled bullshit on it. That's the choice we have now, and they're going to have to cater to it. Because if you pull that bullshit, bye. Yeah, I think you're right. Actually, I have no. I, think you're right. I have no brand loyalty. I do not care. <laughs> you either give me what I want, or I'll go get something else. Because this that is will. a global <laughs> world. So okay. yeah. Oh, uh, it's a lot of uh, going back to your what? What the hell are they releasing? A lot of Korean dramas. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of a lot of stuff from around the world, uh, I think, is adding to that total because they are, like you said, it's a global company, uh, yeah. and they're catering to not only demographics but nationalities. Yeah. Uh, so they're going to become the home for you know a certain brand of Korean drama. Or my aunt was talking to me last year about all the Turkish dramas she was watching on Netflix. Who would have thought? 
Did you hear that Infinity War has been moved up one week? Yes, to <laughs> April 27th, womp, I believe. Womp. I believe is the date that it's being moved to. <laughs> yes. I'm going to be in a theater the whole weekend that weekend, so I guess I'll see how that turns out. <laughs> yeah. Wait, what's playing that weekend? I've got a film festival uh, <laughs> that I think I'm going to go to. I don't uh, know if you I don't know if you guys have heard about it. <laughs> but it's called Windy City Horrorama, and it plays from April 27th to April 29th, 2018, yes. at the Davis Theater in Lincoln Square. They Playing will... now alongside Infinity War. <laughs> Oops. We're going to dig in our heels on that date, and uh, we will be effective counter-programming to when you got your superhero fix. Uh, come on next door and uh, and hang out with us uh, with the scrappy independent crowd uh, we'll have we'll be ha- we'll be the ones having the party yeah that also, one's got a lot of stars and shit you're gonna remember our movies yeah <laughs> and also like infinity war is gonna be there later it's not gonna go anywhere it'll be in theaters for the next two months it'll be fine so come hang out with us instead yes. plus you're not gonna be able to get tickets for it anyway in the davis yeah. so just stumble on across and, and get your blood fix that's yeah. right just come see, over next door you're literally gonna be able to see stuff maybe that you're never gonna get to see again right. so like mm-hmm. come and watch something special yeah uh, but yeah we're not moving yeah we're sitting right where we are <laughs> yeah we hope to see you there with us too yeah we will you'll be there <laughs> you'll be there i'll be there i like the confidence <laughs> Alex, thank you for coming on board one more time for your death wish fix. Oh, it's it's uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, give me a call when you're watching another death wish movie. As soon as we <laughs> find the other ones on VHS, yes. we won't bite you over. <laughs> we might checkerboard it, you know, be like, oh, we found two. We found four. We found three. Now we found one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but we'll cover them all at some point. And I'll work my way back to the original. The original will be the last one I see. Watch. And you're just going to be like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> I liked three better. <laughs> but it will never be said about five or this one where you're like, that's the best. <laughs> yeah. I've, uh, I've, I've set the foundation, put the bar low, ready to ready it's to. It's only graduate. up from here. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. No, no doubt. It is truly only, only up. up. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you for listening again this week. Uh, you can rate and review us on iTunes. That helps us out. And you can also listen to us on Podbean. Come back next week. We are going to take apart another double feature tape that features a movie called Fatal Mission, which I don't even know what it is. So it'll be interesting to jump in. And motherfucking Leprechaun 2 for St. Patrick's Day. That's going to be awesome. I think Peter Fonda is in the other one. Fatal Mission? Yeah. Ooh, a paycheck movie. Nice. (laughs) (laughs) Until next week, take it easy. See ya.